Uh, this morning, if, if you're a guest with us, then you may, probably don't know Doris and Steve Schroeder or Steve and Doris Schroeder. See, we're a gender equal operation. We have pronounced, we said the woman's name first. It was intentional, subliminal messaging right there. Uh, <clears throat> what we're going to do this morning, you guys, is uh, I can say that the, the uh, well, second, I won't exaggerate, probably the, the thing that caught me off guard more than anything else other than one other thing when we planted a church uh, was was the need that marriages need. And I don't mean that in a patronizing way. I just mean like it caught me off guard how many couples uh, would gravitate towards narrate, which is what we want, uh, and, and would just be overwhelmed in their marriage. And frankly, I'm a terrible marriage mentor. And so that made it all the worse because I just talk a lot and I don't listen. And so, you know, it's just not a good thing. Caught me way off guard. Well, what's remarkable about all that is in that season of realizing that I'm terrible, uh, as we grew in relationship with the Schroeders, it began to become more and more apparent that they might, uh, as a couple, be uniquely wired to lead a marriage mentoring uh, ministry, for lack of a better word, for us, like a, a program. And, and what confirmed for me that these were the right people to do this was not only their candor in their own marriage, uh, but also the fact that they pointed out from the very beginning that this wouldn't necessarily just be about narrate about helping you know, dating and engaged and married couples within Narrate, but that in our effort to want to matter in our community, uh, to be the kind of church that the most ardent critic of Christianity was bummed if we ceased to exist, that maybe one of the more relevant things we could do in our community was provide excellent uh, free marriage mentoring. And so Doris and Streve, what they're going to do is just kind of open up their heart a little bit, let you know a little bit who they are, unpack the word for you a bit, and ultimately help you understand what's going on, you know, behind closed doors in the marriage mentoring realm around Narrate as we're in these kind of infant stages of this thing. But uh, in my view, there's something really cool percolating back there. So would you give it up for Steve and Doris? All right. Thanks, Adam. Uh, now that Adam has covered my whole intro... Um, <laughs> We can go right to the closing. Uh, if you wouldn't mind in joining me in opening up in prayer, I'd appreciate that. Heavenly Father, I thank you for, as, as we sang about this morning, that this is, this is sacred, this is holy ground, and we appreciate the fact that you have sent your spirit here to be with us. We know that because you've promised in your word that wherever two or more of us are gathered, you are there in our midst, and we welcome you here. We thank you for being here. We just ask your blessing upon each and every one here today that uh, we might take something away that, that would help us uh, understand ourselves a little bit better, help us in our relationships in general, and specifically our relationships in marriage. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So what are we doing here, Doris? <laughs> marriage ministry, remember? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so good morning. Uh, Steve and I are both so excited to head up this ministry and to be given the opportunity to serve couples here at Narrate and also hopefully in the community. So what we'd like to do today is uh, give you a little insight into the vision we have for the ministry, some of our life experiences, and some of the tools we're going to be using in the ministry. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh... <laughs> There is one thing that I do have to tell you about ahead of time. I do have to give you a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, we normally are doing a kids' ministry, and uh, we lead the large group. So um, as you can imagine, a group all the way from two-year-olds up to uh, third and fourth graders, um, that's quite a, a group of people to try to keep their attention and focus during a large lesson time. So I do have to warn you that I have some tactics that I use with those kids. Um, <laughs> if you see me leave the stage, I am coming to get right in front of you so I can get your <laughs> attention back. Brian, Brian and his wife helped out a couple of weeks ago. He just nervously elbowed his wife and said, Honey, if I start falling asleep, pinch me or something. I don't want him coming in front of me. So that's my disclaimer. With that, uh, we'll, we'll kind of jump into the, um, into the message. One of the things we thought we'd start off with, you know, the, the scriptures, and, and by the way, this is the one that Adam usually uses. Um, I tried it. And even with glasses, I don't have long enough arms. So we're going to use the, uh, the larger version here because if I tried to read from this, you would all get a, a very firm quotation in fluent North Korean. 
So we'll avoid that, so maybe you can get something out of it. But um, what we'd like to start off with, you know, the scripture tells us that uh, we can learn an awful lot from kids, and we've seen that over the years. So we'd like to pass on some advice that, that we've learned um, from some kids. Kids were asked questions about marriage, and we'd like to share that with you because I think you might just learn something today. So on the question of how do you decide who to marry, Alan, now here's, a, here's some sage advice for everybody. Alan, who's age 10, says, you got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports, and she should keep the chips and dip coming. There you have it. Any other wisdom? Well, Kristen, age 10, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. Ooh, ouch. Yeah. Ooh. So kids tell us what the right age is to get married. Camille, she's age 10. She's got this all figured out, so pay attention. 23 is the best age. Because by then, you know, you've known the person for forever. And how can a stranger tell if two people are married? Derek, age eight, knows the answer. You might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. See, our kids, there was never any, any question as to who their parents were. Yes. <laughs> so what do you think your mom and dad have in common? Lori, Lori's got the answer to that. She says, both don't want any more kids. So what do you think most people do on a date? A gal age eight says, dates are for having fun, right? And people should use them to get to know each other. Sounds good, right? I mean, even boys have something to say if you listen long enough. <laughs> That's right. Doris can attest to that. <laughs> no. It took a long time, but I finally said something that made sense. But then again, you know, on the first date, we just tell each other lies, and that usually gets us interested enough to go for a second date, right? So when's it okay to kiss somebody? When they're rich. Oh. It's obvious, right? Yeah, but I don't know about that. I have a differing opinion. So does Kurt. Kurt says the law says you have to be 18, so he wouldn't want to mess with that. So the rule goes like this. And Howard, age eight, has come up with the rule. If you kiss someone, then you should marry them and have kids with them. It's the right thing to do. So the real question is, is it better to be single or is it better to be married? Well, Anita has an answer for that. It's better for girls to be single, but not for boys. Boys need somebody to clean up after them. There's a lot of wisdom in that, isn't there? And how would the world be different if people didn't get married? Kelvin, age eight, says there sure would be a lot of kids to explain now, wouldn't there? That's, that's very sage advice. And the question is, how would you make a marriage work? I think this young man has the right concept. He's just got to polish the delivery a little bit. He says, tell your wife that she looks pretty, even if she looks like a dump truck. So there you have it, out of the mouth of babes. Some wisdom on uh, how to get along better in your marriage. So now that we have a, a picture, a vision of, of uh, marriage from the eyes of kids, what does God say about marriage? And, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little look into, into Genesis here. And as I mentioned, even with the large print, I need some assistance. Genesis 18 said, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. Uh, the kids agreed with that too. Um, I will make him a helper suitable for him. And then God went about making all sorts of different animals and other things that could be helpers to Adam. And Adam said, Hey, you know, God, we got this honest relationship. You know, it's getting close, but not quite there. So then down in verse 21, God caused Adam to go into a sleep and he took a rib out and it says in verse 22, the Lord God fashioned it into a woman, the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. 
And now the man said, This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. How many of you have heard that last verse in in a wedding at some point most recently? You know, I have too. Lots Lots of weddings, you hear that scripture. But in preparing for this message, that was the first time it really occurred to me, right immediately after God gets done creating the earth and everything in it, he sets forth the concept of marriage. And a marriage of two people coming from different backgrounds, different upbringings, different experiences, different talents and abilities, bringing them together and saying, now become one. And, and as we begin to take a look at you know, leading a, a ministry around mentorship in marriages, there are really a couple of things that I think that we, we began to look at. What is that ingredient that is required for successful relationships in general, but particularly within marriage? And we look to this passage in Genesis, and right there, he establishes a, a, critical, um, a critical tenet, and that's that two come together, and they take their respective differences, their respective uh, skills and talents and abilities, and they meld it together to become a powerful force. And then we take a look at also, um, take a look at Song of Solomon. Now that's, a, that's an uh, uh, somewhat of a, a difficult book for a lot of people to read. Uh, but when you take a look at it, and what I like to do is, is read the whole five chapters all, all together and say, what is the takeaway? And when you do that, what really comes out as, as a real strong message out of Song of Solomon is this longing for a relationship. It's, it's that passion of... Christ to the church of the passion between a husband and a wife and bringing that, bringing that forward together. And I think, you know, I, I, get, I get really excited when I see that passion, you know, um, in, in churches. You, you watch the worship band up here today. Every one of them has their own little style, but you can tell they are where they need to be. They are passionate about what they do, whether it's, whether it's Brian trying to make that string do exactly what he wants to get that sound out of it, or Jason over there practically coming over the tops of the, of the plexiglass. But that, to me, is what I really love to see, because that's somebody who is passionate about what they do. And that's what we see in, in the scriptures, and especially in Song of Solomon, We see that level of passion, that longing coming out, desiring a deep relationship. And so that's kind of the pattern that that, that we want to try to pursue in this this ministry. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, share a little bit of our experiences as we've gone through our years of of marriage. And uh, hopefully you'll see... You'll see some things in there that, that maybe you can go, <laughs> yeah, that's us, yep, that's me. Uh, but really the vision that we have uh, for this ministry, and Doris is going to talk a lot more about the specifics on it, is really to provide a venue so that, so that couples can explore and, and get a, a, a better outcome out of this journey called a relationship. So, you know, one of the things that we take a look at, you know, how do you increase a chance for a successful marriage or, or how do you, um, you know, how do you bring about that longing, that oneness? And, um, you know, Scripture talks in Ephesians five twenty nine through 33 about the two becoming one. And we saw that in, in the Genesis chapter 2. Doris, would you mind reading Ephesians 5? For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, 
and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So there in that scripture, we're seeing this concept of a holy union. We're seeing that it's, that it's emblematic of the relationship of Christ to the church as well as husband and wife together. So let's talk a little bit about this, this madness known as the Schroeder household and in particular the uh, Stephen Doris marriage. We're, we're going to share a little bit about uh, what we've gone through over the years and I can see our children in the front row here just cringing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that, is, that is worth it right there. Uh, so one of the things that, you know, I, I just have to say, I have been totally blessed in, in, in my marriage relationship. Uh, Doris has been, you know, a, a tremendous helper for me because um, as you'll see from some of these stories, I was a bit of a mess uh, when she inherited me and, and she's brought me along. Um, but one of the things that, that we really... Um, saw as critical in our relationship was the topic of communication. And uh, we've got uh, a scripture in James that, Doris, if you'd bring that up and, and read that, that really addresses a critical component of a relationship, and that's communication. How you do it, if you do it well, if you do it poorly, there are dramatically different end results. Are you ready for that? Mm-hmm. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs. Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So there we see the power of the tongue. This same tongue can bring forth blessing and it can bring forth cursing. And sometimes, especially when we get in those real stressful situations and, and we begin arguing that tongue can get away from us, and, it, be, and it, it is so powerful that it can cut, and it can cut deep. When you take a look at a marriage relationship, when you are that personal with each other, nobody can hurt you more or bless you more than your spouse or your significant other if you're a dating couple. So we really want to encourage uh, you know, really watching the tongue. And, and as an example, um, you know, when, when we first got married, we came from radically different backgrounds as far as our upbringing. Um, in her family, they called them discussions. We discuss everything. And, yeah, boy, do they discuss things. <laughs> and in my family, I called that an all-out fight, you know. Picture the cartoon, right, with a rear and the paw coming out, that's the way I viewed what they were doing. She's going to fight. That wasn't a fight. We were just having a discussion. Well, you were really passionate about that discussion. Of course we are. <laughs> like, okay, so uh, now you see what I entered into. So, in our relationship, I was flat out sunk. There was no help for me. So we would enter into a discussion. Well, because of my background, anytime something got a little bit, ten, you know, tense, that was my opportunity to get out of Dodge. And that, that was the way that I dealt with things. Well, Doris had this knack for cutting me off at strategic venues, <laughs> forcing me into a corner. So I was a captive audience. There was no place for me to hide. And she'd say, we're going to talk about this. I don't want to talk about it. We're going to talk about this. I don't want to talk about it. But we need to talk about it. We need to have a discussion. How else are we going to resolve anything? I don't care about resolving it. <laughs> yes, you do. His I way did. of resolving it was 
you just wait two or three days and it just goes away. Exactly. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, there's one person up there. All right, yeah. Well, let me tell you, I did not get that opportunity. She would chase me around the house until we sat down and we would talk about things. And one of the things that I had to deal with during that time is, in my viewpoint, I didn't understand unconditional love. To me, love was something conditional. If I was doing something well, if I was doing something good, then you had a reason to love me. If I screwed up, if I messed up, then how in the world could you love me? And I was really good at looking in the mirror and going, man, you are one messed up dude. And nobody beat me up worse than me. And so this is kind of the framework that I would enter into a discussion with. And so one of the things that Doris taught me was this concept of unconditional love. That no matter what we were talking about, no matter what we disagreed about, it didn't change the way that she felt about me. So she used the power of her tongue to encourage me to draw me into having a discussion. And it was so funny because the first time that I felt open enough to actually say that something bothered me, it was like, man, I filleted myself open, laid myself bare. And I was like, well, you know, when you said this, it made me feel like X. And she's like, at all? I'm like, what are you talking about? I just bared my whole soul to you. She goes, we're having a discussion. But I learned through that process that no matter what I said, no matter what I did, she was there for me. And she was always going to be there to encourage me. So this concept of communication, fighting fair, this being free to say, you know what, when you said this, this is the way it made me feel. You know, she didn't intend it that way, but that's the way I received it. So this whole concept of communication is extremely important in a, in a marriage. Being encouraging and supportive. Um, there's a scripture in Romans 4, verse 16 to 18, and what I want you to focus on here is the concept that's being brought forward, not so much the actual verse. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. So there's two concepts in there that I really wanted to pick out. The first one was grace. We all need grace because we're all going to screw up. We're all going to mess up in our relationships in general. And so we all need grace. So be quick to give grace to others. And, and that was something that, you know, that we learned to do fairly early and, and has really helped us out. And the second concept there was when, when we first entered into our marriage, she had to do a lot of this faith thing that Abraham did. Even though he was old and he was promised to be the father of many nations, <laughs> you know, things weren't looking so good. Well, guess what? She was like, oh boy, what did I get myself into? But she started calling things that be not as though they were. She started saying, no, you are not that lousy person that you see in the mirror. This is who you are. And I love you and I care about you. And you don't worry about it. You will become that. So that's the concept that I, that I want to leave you with as we kind of enter into the next part. And that's talking about specifically about this, about this marriage uh, mentorship ministry. But before we do, so far this has all been one-sided, right? It's all been, you know, me learning and whatnot. I got a good one for you. So I told you about the fact that she would chase me around the house. 
until I talked about things? Well, a couple years after this concept got introduced, we were at my parents' place. We got in a discussion. She didn't want to be in the discussion. She went down the basement. I cornered her, said, we're going to talk about this, honey. She goes, I don't want to talk about it. No, we're going to talk about it. We need to resolve this. I don't want to talk about it. I said, oh, no, you don't, lady. You created this monster. Now you live with him. <laughs> we had a nice laugh about that, and then we're able to talk about it. And honey, he, you? he was right. He yeah. was right. How about, know? hey, is this on tape, Adam? <laughs> I was right. You all heard it. He's been right many times, believe right. me. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the ministry and, and what we're trying to uh, provide not only to the Narrate family but also to the community. One of the, the tools that we're going to be using is called Prepare Enrich. And it's a proven resource that's been uh, designed by two doctors in Minnesota uh, over the past 30 years. And there's been over 3 million couples that have been taking this assessment using the tools called Prepare and Rich. Um, the important thing about this is that it's an assessment that the couples fill out themselves. Yeah. So it's, it's feedback directly from you. And what it opens up is it identifies some strength and growth areas in your relationship, and it also stimulates open dialogue for areas that are really hard to discuss. Um, you know, it, it affects different areas and asks questions about different areas of your life. You know, conflict resolution, finances, uh, even your spiritual beliefs, mm -hmm. uh, communication, the roles in your marriage, uh, you know, roles that your, your family, your mother and father have played because that all builds into your relationship and who you are. So um, this assessment is just a fantastic tool that we have. Um, I don't know if you've got anything more to add to that. Um, so is this test pass fail? No. <laughs> See, that's the most it's common misperception. It's not a test. It's an assessment to find out where there are areas of alignment, where are there mm -hmm. areas that perhaps you need to have some discussions about and come to a, a place of resolution on those. And the ma marriage mentorship ministry is to provide you with an opportunity to sit down with couples, maybe once, maybe twice a, a month, couples that have been there, done that. They've had... They've had an apple out of that sack, and they know exactly, you know, what you might be facing. And the whole idea, then, is to give you a safe forum in order to be able to, to dialogue and come to that oneness as a couple. And so the, the marriage ministry, that's really the vision, like we talked about, is to help couples on this journey of exploration, this, this journey of coming together. Was, was that good enough? Did I do that well? <laughs> All right. How about that? So when we talk about, uh, about the, the ministry, what we're trying to do, there's a couple areas. It's, it's for married couples. Um, it's not just for couples who are in trouble. Just like you go and you take your car and you get the oil changed every 2,000, 3,000 miles. It's a preventative maintenance thing. Um, we talked to a couple in between services, and they just said, you know, hey, it's great to take this assessment just to, just as a regular, you know, where are we at in our relationship? Where are we at on this road? And, it's, and I think it's a great little tool. So, um, you know, we'll be available after service if you have some, some questions that you, that you want to ask about it. Um, certainly, the, the more hands that we have involved in a marriage mentorship ministry, um, the lighter the load it is for everybody. And um, as Adam talked about, as we talked about, one of the reasons we came here to narrate is because we'd been in a number of different church situations, and it was really great coming into that gathering setting, right? Enjoying each other's company and enjoying the relationship that we had. But we always felt something was missing. And the first meeting that we had with Adam, he was like, well, we really like the gathering thing, but uh, we... We also really believe in this scattering thing. And we looked at each other and like, eh, that's it. That was the missing piece. So, you know, that is a very important component of this in, in our view, is not only to be able to bless the Narrate family, but also be able to reach into the community as a scattering opportunity. 
So um, the, the focus is on married couples. It's on, and then also we're big believers in the whole preventative maintenance thing. As most of you who are married know, um, there's, there's a big change that happens when you go from two independent couples to now coming together as a married couple and you find out that he doesn't put the tube, uh, cap on the toothpaste tube and that really bugs the daylights out of you and, and those types of things. Um, and just plain unrealistic expectations going into marriage, the, uh, the fairy tale happily ever after thing, right? So we're, we're very big believers in, in that pre-marriage mentoring as well. Being really honest, being very open with new couples, saying, hey, here's some of the things you're going to have to deal with when you first get married. So that's a little bit about, um, about our, uh, our lives, a little bit about uh, the Marriage Mentor Ministry. We wanted to introduce it to you. Um, if anybody has a passion for helping out marry, uh, married couples or helping out couples by meeting with them, having dinner with them, whatever it happens to be a few times a month, once a month, whatever it happens to be, uh, please let us know. Uh, we're going to be, uh, this is kind of an introduction Sunday, let you know that this ministry is out there, and then uh, be able to roll it out more formally as we go. And uh, uh, our jobs are going to be to try to oversee it and to try to control the growth, if you will, on it. But uh, we sure appreciate the time that you've given us today to share a little bit about uh, our, our vision for, um, for this marriage mentorship ministry. We appreciate your time, and uh, if you wouldn't mind joining me, we'll close in prayer, and then uh, we'll turn it over back to Adam. Father, we thank you for this time to, to be together, and uh, we just thank you for the journey. There's so much that is entailed in the journey. I would hate to think that we would just arrive at a destination without the joys and the trials and the tribulations of going through the process of getting there. It really enhances the, the enjoyment in where we're at. And I just thank you for being a part of it. Thank you that your uh, spirit is here to guide us and we rely upon you for that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, yeah. Way to go, you guys. They're all-stars, aren't they? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a cool thing going on there. Uh, obviously, we want to keep in front of you as well that next week we're at the Grand Street, so find us there. Uh, would you grab an info card if you have it? Well, y'all have one. Uh, this is We're commemorating lots of things, and being the uh, deconstructionist that I am, I keep pointing out the things that we don't have to do, but we really did like being here. Uh, you never have to deal with that Coke cup again. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, it, it's remarkable. Uh, Anyway, uh, here's the deal, you guys, is when we started gathering, well, preview services last summer and grand opening in October, we said, hey, what if we just talked a lot about Jesus and a lot about his kingdom and a lot about what it looks like to follow him and, and what it looks like to receive salvation by grace? What if we just talked about that? And then periodically we looked over our shoulder and said, hey, anybody uh, start following Jesus in the last year or so? Remember that? It's kind of been the culture of salvation around here is uh, understanding that we live in a culture where most conversions, if you will, uh, most decisions to follow Jesus, uh, they're happen happening gradually, not dramatically. Uh, we're going to do something called Vision Weekend on September 12th. And a large part of that is dedicated, obviously, to what we see coming forward in the future what is in, the, in front of us, uh, and part of it is to celebrate what God's done in the past. So what I'm going to ask you to do is if in the last year uh, you've made a decision to follow Jesus as you kind of look over your shoulder and go, yeah, oh yeah, geez, wow, I didn't even think of it that way, but yeah, I think I did start following Jesus uh, in the last year or so. Would you let us know that on the info card? Uh, and really for no better reason than we want to be able to share that number. We want to be able to celebrate that, and I think it'll be real worshipful for the Narrate family to know, like, hey, check this out. Uh, that little experiment that we're working, uh, it worked. Or maybe we got to go, it doesn't work, and we've got to fine-tune that. The other thing uh, related to all of that is we're going to do a baptism celebration on September 12th. I should use a handheld all the time. I haven't moved. Uh, on September 12th, we're going to do a baptism celebration at, I uh, forgot the name of it, two services in a row now. What's the name of that place? Spring Meadow. Spring Meadow. Uh, after the services on the Vision Weekend, 
on opening weekend of football. We'll all have our DVRs on, and we'll go down there and we'll celebrate Jesus. Just kidding. That's a little sarcastic, but it's kind of true because I will have, but I don't have a DVR. I'll have an old VHS tape <laughs> plugged into my like granular TV because I don't have cable, and it'll be a wonderful experience when I get home. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> if you've made a decision to follow Jesus and, and haven't been baptized, then I just want to get that in front of you. I don't want to sell it to you, but do want to say that, you know, the scriptures articulate that it's the logical next step of obedience. Uh, and frankly, it, it can play a really large part in our community, uh, getting to worship uh, salvation as God intended it to be experienced. Because we think of it in purely individualistic terms, that God and grace and following him is all about me and God. It's not, it's not quite the context of the scriptures. The gospel is a community orientated thing. Being saved is a community orientated thing. And so I just want to put out there for you persuasively, I guess, that, that getting baptized is about you for sure. It's also about the Narrate family and getting to celebrate together. Here's what's going on. So the info card that I asked you to grab is for communicating those two things to us. Like, you know, if, if you go like, yeah, I started following Jesus in the last uh, year. You can be anonymous if you want. You can write your name if you want. Just let us know that. And, and if you want to talk about baptism more, would you at least let me know? I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee. And I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's cold. I know it's dirty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, life is hard. So... <laughs> There you have that. Can't wait to see you at the Grand Street Theater. As every week goes, we can help use help tearing down if you want to throw stuff around for a half an hour. See you guys. Have a great week.